Thanks for coming. Today I have the honor to introduce Dr. Doug Hay. Uh, for those of you who didn't have the chance to read the email I sent around in the announcement, um, the biography that's in there is a very fun read, so I encourage you to read it. <laughs> and it uh, uh, provides a good overview of Dr. Doug um, Hay's very interesting career, and which includes work at the Pacific Biological Station, at the DFO in Nanaimo, and this time as a lecturer in fish biology in various different universities across Canada, and sometimes teaching abroad in Korea as well. Today, Dr. Hay spends his time as a scientist emeritus at the Pacific Biological Station and on student committees, um, sharing his vast knowledge and experience. His talk today will be on the locally important and threatened um, Yukon. And um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Lake. Uh, thank you, Anna. That's a, a, a new uh, pronunciation of Ulican, Ulican, Ulican. I think it was about uh, 50 years ago, well, more than 50 years ago, when I was first on this campus, and I even perceived Carl. And uh, so, so it's, it's always interesting to come back to a place and I don't even recognize it anymore. But my roots here go back quite a ways. The, the title I, I, I put to uh, Dr. Sang Yun some time ago was, was Knowledge Gaps. So I started the title off with Knowledge Gaps and I'll just review a few of them. It's um, really what I wanted to talk to you about today was, was not so much the gaps but a way that I think they might be filled. We did some work on the Fraser River this spring. We did about six or seven weeks of little gill netter, and we were able to catch hooligans live, which has never been done before, at least in this part of the world. And that opens up all sorts of opportunities. And so I, the knowledge gaps, the list I've got here, is um, in part a reflection of that. So the, the first gap I've got is there's no explanation for the apparent differences between offshore and river abundance. Offshore, off the coast of BC, on the shelf, there are really thousands of tons. That's millions and millions of them. In the rivers, there's very much fewer, by two orders of magnitude. And there's no explanation for that. Um, there's, no un there's no understanding of the pre-spawning distribution of hooligans in the estuary river, and that's really quite important for the Fraser because Development, the proposed developments there are, are stunning. There's coal terminals expanded. Um, uh, terminals for loading cars. The province is going to increase the height of the levees, and it's the nearshore environment in the, in the Fraser where they're spawning. So that's that's one of the other gaps. The third one I've got is the role of salinity. So so hooligan are a marine fish that spawn in fresh water. Like, like, and they're part of a, a smelt, the smelt family, that, that have a capacity to, to live in both environments. But they really are marine fish, and, and they might be using some marine water, some low salinity waters for spawning. And if they are, some of our assessment methodologies are flawed. Those are ones that I started myself. <coughs> These are two other, uh, uh, major knowledge gaps, population structure. I'm not going to talk about those today, but they're one of, uh, that list could be expanded. So I, that's just oops, pointing out that, shoot. I'm not going to really talk about that at all. I'd like to give you a little bit of background, more than I, I really should, I suppose. We didn't know much about hooligans. Uh, at least a, a, on a, a technical or a scientific way uh, until uh, the 1990s. There were a few scientific reports, mainly done out of the biological station in the NIMO, but, but very few. Um, and to my knowledge, there were almost no university theses on, on um, uh, hooligans. And, and from the 1930s to 1990s, that, that, that was it. Only a few technical reports. Um, it, uh, Bill Ricker, you know, the preeminent science of the biological station started looking at hooligans. And he's written a technical report. In fact, he started doing some of his first stock recruit analysis on hooligans. He gave up. It didn't work very well. But um, 
but, but that was about it. In 1990s, there was some uh, work starting mostly in the, the northern BC. And there was a thing called the Kamano Completion Project, where they were taking Fraser River water and putting it into the Kamano River. That got a lot of uh, a action going. And there was a concern about pulp mills. Pulp mills did contaminate hooligans. There were uh, uh, legal uh, arrangements between, between um, major companies that, there and the, the highest of First Nation for loss of access to hooligans. But it really wasn't on the radar of people in other parts of BC. In about 1994, there was a very sharp decline in hooligans. Uh, it, was, it happened in the Fraser. The commercial fishermen on the Fraser, there was a small commercial fishery, they called DFO in saying, what's going on with the hooligans? At the same time, hooligans crashed in the, in the Columbia River, and they crashed in several other rivers, but nobody realized at the time that there was something going on among them. And uh, so that's, and, and Joe Bauer is here, he will, he will attest to that. That's when they, they brought us in, 1995. We, we had some of the, the first meetings. And so there was a number of things happening in the mid-1990s that uh, led to hooligan work. And, and, and um, you know, at that time, everyone can, was concerned that if, they, if there were any things negative about hooligans, it was in the habitat, freshwater habitat. And uh, the BC forests were, were in, in very much involved, looking at, you know, could it, could it be logging that's affecting their, their, their habitat in freshwater? Um, so that's what was sort of happening at that time. In 2000, f f following all that, we wrote a, a thing, a Peace Arc paper on the status of hooligans. That was one of the first things that, that brought it together. 2009, the U.S. Uh, looked at the, the Columbia River and they called it danger. They, they got going quite a bit faster than we did. In 2011, the Coastal Wake paper, they looked at all of the waters. Um, Megan Moody, a graduate of this institution, and I wrote a Coastal Wake paper, and, and as a consequence, it was called Threatened. And in 2012, there's another paper, which is, they call it the, the recovery potential analysis, saying, what can we do about them? We can't give you any money, but what can you do to bring them back? And this, this is not, this is very small, but in 2013, 2014, there's a small group of people, it included the Vancouver City Police, Vancouver Parks, um, Rick Hansen Society, the uh, Salmon Foundation, Port Metro Vancouver, got together saying, can we do something about hooligans on the Fraser River? And I'll be talking a little bit about, about, about that. Just a little bit more background. Now, you know, hooligans have been around for a long time. They, they, they are, you know, hooligans were around when mammals, I think, were rodents. Um, our, our ancestors were rodents. They, rodents. They, have been, they have been around since the dinosaur time. In, in, in this part of the world, um, the, 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 the knowledge of them is restricted to First Nations. In the late 1800s, you know, all there was was a, was a fairly big commercial fishery up in the Nass. Um, and the, the, fish, the fishery is mainly for, for a little bit for food, a lot for, for animal food, make food. And, and the catches in the Fraser sometimes got up to about 250 tons. If you look at the whole coast of, of, of North America, uh, the biggest population is in the Columbia, the second is in the Fraser. Columbia is probably about 10 times bigger. In 95, we started doing some assessments of, of, of bar, uh, hooligans in the Fraser based on egg and larval surveys. And, and we started the license limitation 96. And since that time, basically, the fish has been closed. And I'll, I'll show you some data in a little bit. There seems to be a recovery. Uh, maybe a, a part, a little bit of one. This is now just some, some biological background on hooligans. And if you look at, hooligans are a smelt family. There's only about 11 species of smelt within the whole family Osmeridae. Most of them are confined here to the north, um, the northeast Pacific. And the, um, this is a hooligan. They, 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 they get up maybe, maybe to the southern Bering Sea and down to, to the north part of California. And that's it. We think in, the, in this total area that they, we just don't know how many runs there are. I think there's far less than 100. I think there's probably between 30 or 40. 
The Columbia is the biggest. Maybe the Fraser is the next, but there's some big rivers in Alaska like the Copper. If you look at their distribution in the North Pacific, um, they are confined to the mainland. There are no records of Lulavin spawning in Vancouver Island that except two. One in the Somas River uh, for one year, one in the Nimkish River north end of Vancouver Island for one year. They make mistakes and they seem, seem to be able to, to um, go in the wrong river sometimes. Um, They've never been recorded uh, routinely in, in the, uh, the, in the uh, Haida Gwaii. Maybe a little bit in, in Kodiak, but basically they are mainland species. And they seem to spawn in coastal islands that have freshets. You know, they, 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 the bulk of the water is coming out in the spring, not the fall. Whereas is in the, the coastal islands, most of the water is coming out in the fall. That, that might mean anything. That will reset that. And, and also these uh, freshets are, are rivers that rain snowpacks. The puzzle for me is that Oligans have been around for millions of years and we've had successive glaciations. How do these little fish survive during this time? And maybe they have some survival repertoire that we don't know about. If you look for, for where Oligans are, I've already said they're, they're not on these islands, these are the main rivers the, the red dots indicate rivers where Ulican seem to have a sort of a, a, a more, a, a bigger presence and probably spawn annually, which is the Nass, which is one of the bigger ones, the Skeena, um, the, the Kitimat and, and Keldella, the, 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 um, the, the Kitlope and uh, Kamano. The, um, I think that's, I, I don't know what that one is. That's the, the, the Bella Coola for sure, Oakino. Uh, Wakeman, or the King Come Inlet, Nice Inlet. The, the river that goes into Nice Inlet is called the Kleena Kleena. And Kleena in, in Salish, it means Greece. It's, and one of the products, one of the First Nations uh, uses of Ulligans was to put them in big pots, big pits, render them down, and they, they rotted, and they, they made a, a product called Grease, which I think is a pejorative term. It's called grease, but it really is um, ulic and lipid material, and um, it can be really quite good, and it can be really quite bad. Um, there's the Fraser. There might be a little bit of a run sometimes in the Squamish, but the Fraser is there. These are the runs where I, I think there's nine key runs in, in, in BC, and I've already m mentioned them, and these are the runs with the circles where there is some indication that maybe a, uh, you have a little bit of quantitative data although not very much. Sorry. This is where Ulligans are, are found to a certain extent offshore. The red dots indicate research sets where they're not found. The blue dots indicate research sets where they are found. And they are found usually around on, on the shelf waters, right on the break, um, 100 meter edge or so. This indicates uh, these are all research catches, uh, 2.5 six seven kilo, uh, kilograms per hour for fishing. The biggest uh, areas were, are found off the lower west coast of Vancouver Island. This is where the, the there's been a shrimp trawl fishery there, and the bycatch of hooligans of, of, uh, in the shrimp trawl has been a big factor. It's been a big it's been a, a factor which has prominent in, in, in the in the understanding of hooligans, but it might not be related to to their apparent decline. This is a, just a quick note about, about Ulligan stocks. The genetics of, of Ulligans, based on microsatellite DNA, indicates that the major rivers do have some degree of separation. And, and if you compare them to other fish, they are not as distinct river to river as salmonids, but they are more distinct uh, from one river to the next than, than say, offshore herring populations. The Fraser is distinct from the, the, the Columbia, at least based on microsatellites, and it's distinct from some, some of the other ones. Nevertheless, this is what the COSUIC committee did. Megan Moody and I didn't do it this way, but the COSUIC committee took our report and they said, well, we're going to lump all these into a central thing, and they're, they called the Fraser separately. I don't want to go too much into it right now, but, um, but there is a controversy in this way. The Americans looked at it a little bit differently. They just said, well, you know, the, the, the Columbia is a source and, and maybe it extends to one big population. That, 
the population structure of hooligans is still to be resolved. And again, that's just the same sort of thing, um, shown a different way. The way that the Kosovic people, um, well, the, the Fraser is distinct unit, the DU, a central coast distinct unit, and the north coast. The, the, the NISCA and the NAS looked at this and they got really upset and they said, we don't like this. And they, they said, our, our fish are not threatened. Um, and they, they, they went to Kosovic and they re-examined it and took it to one level. It's, it's, it was called threatened and now it's called endangered, not quite as bad. Offshore, there are two main age groups. We see them as, as fish that we call age one plus. So they're at least 12 months old and perhaps a little bit older, and a, another sort of size group. And if you trot these over time from offshore catches, you can see these size groups marching through. It's very difficult to age ulibans. Bill Rickers had, had, uh, had uh, technicians trying to age them from scales and it didn't work. The otoliths are atrocious. Although there could be lunar effects on the uh, on the otoliths that we see, that you know about one lunar effect, one lunar ring that seem to match with about three years, but by and large they seem to be three three year old fish. In the rivers, the the, the, the size distribution you see in the rivers corresponds to the size distribution, the biggest size distribution we see in the ocean, and that seems to make sense. There could also be a few fish that are age fours. There's a latitudinal effect. The, um, the, 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 I think they're much younger in the Columbia, probably the maximum age is two there. Up in Alaska, I'm sure there's age fours and fives. Sense. That's the same sort of thing, just showing the, 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 the striking two, uh, two age classes you see. And, and again, as, as you look through the time, you see these age these size classes. I wanted to say a little bit about Fraser, Fraser River assessments. When we started doing this in, in 1995, um, I, I, was, I was interested in doing larval fish assessments and herring assessments in particular using, using uh, ichthyoplankton techniques. So we had very small bongo nets that we were using for catching herring larvae in very small places. So we just used these in the Fraser. Little bongo nets with a, with a flow meter attached and we've, we fished these off of small boats. These were usually um, uh, small gill netters that over the years have been uh, um, uh, were not rented, uh, chartered from, from one, of, one or other First Nations, usually the, first, the uh, Musqueam First Nation. Using standard, standard techniques. Just, we usually fish them for about seven or eight minutes. We used uh, diagonal toes. The, the contents came out and we were um, take four or five hundred samples a year throughout the Fraser. When the, when the debris comes out, there's an awful lot of woody debris, a lot of insect debris, and we always hired students uh, to, to sample it. The students never lasted more than one summer. <laughs> but um, but it, it, it worked and, 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 and the larvae were very small, usually about half a million, about um, five millimeters long. Always caught eggs and larvae, live eggs and larvae in these samples. Which, and that turns out to happen everywhere. This is what a new egg looks like with a well-developed uh, yolk. This would be uh, probably a dead egg. Um, and the, the larvae looks, it's a messy larvae, but that's what, what it looks like. Everywhere you go, we see in our plankton samples, eggs, which is kind of neat. I don't know why that happens. Um, but the, there's an implication to this. And, and the implication is, uh, when I say everywhere, this happens in the Kitimat River. Megan has found this also in the Bella Coola. It happens in the Columbia. These eggs are ripping down the river with the larvae. We're finding them at all the three depths. When we fished in the river, we fished on the north side, the middle, the south, and three depths when each of those. Usually a cross section of nine things. We find eggs and larvae in each one. And the implication of that is people want to know, you know, where are the spawning sites in the Fraser? And that's important to know. But it's also important to know that the whole Fraser is used as an incubation site for eggs are, are developing in that time. It, the eggs are small. They're slightly adhesive. 
the larvae are, are coming out at, I said, five millimeters, five, six millimeters. They, they, they have a yolk sac, but they, they last about a week. And, and in small rivers, they're, when they're flushed into marine waters within hours, minutes sometimes, and probably in about a day in the Fraser. So if, they're, if, the, if the egg was somehow released into the water column in the, in the northern part of the river, say around Westminster, it would probably be in, in marine waters within a day. We don't know much about where they are as, as larvae, except they seem to spend their first summer as larvae in perhaps in the Strait of Georgia, and then they might somehow migrate out to the shelf. I want to say a little bit about pairing assessments based on egg and larval surveys. There's a couple of papers, really quite bad, but, um, but they, they do exist. The concept is really very simple. It's simply that if you go out to the river and, and use the egg and larval, uh, use a, a, a egg or a larval sampling thing, the idea is to figure out, can you figure out how many eggs there are? So, so in this case, the P is just the, the number of eggs you're finding at a, a certain time. So, and, 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 and you're doing that by looking at the density. How many eggs per unit volume is there? Usually when you put those little nets out, we're fishing four to five cubic meters. So we count up, count up the numbers of eggs or larvae we're getting per cubic meter. And that would give us a, an estimate of the density. We know that we know the, uh, the, 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 the total volume of, river, of the river coming down is estimated every day by, by what the water is counted. So we know the volume of the river coming down. We know the estimate of the density going down. And the, the, the interval is, is just the, the time when we're, we're looking at it. So, so in fact, the interval is usually, sometimes we were sampling twice a week. That was a, a two or three day interval. And that would give us an estimate, a reasonably good estimate, I think, of the total numbers of, of eggs coming down. And that's exactly what Megan is doing up in the, um, in the uh, Bella Coola. The Americans have now started this in, in Columbia, and it's starting in the NAS. So this is a, a technique modified one way or the other, which gives an estimate of the total, total egg and larva production. And if you know the number of eggs, it's a very simple matter to go over the numbers of spawning adults or the total biomass. It's, simple, it's simply that we know that the number of eggs per gram, the relative fecundity, is about 700 eggs. And if you adjust for, for males, it's about 300 eggs. So you, you can come up with an estimate for the biomass. We think in the Fraser River, it's quite conservative for a number of reasons, because we're not looking at mortality between the egg and larval stage, but, but still, it might be meaningful. Um, this is what we started doing in 1995. We started sampling all over the place. We sampled, sampled out in the marine waters, UBC, we sampled in the north arm, we sampled in the south arm, it's called Dees Island, where the tunnel is, Tilbury Island, and we sampled all the way up to Mission. And it was really quite difficult. And I'm gonna flash ahead and then come back. That's what we did in 1995. We couldn't keep that up. And eventually, we just started doing a couple of samples, one at Dees Island, one at New Westminster, and one at Barnston Island. And, and we carried on. When we did these egg and larval surveys, it, what we're finding is that the, 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 um, the numbers of, of the biomass we're estimating in the upstream areas was always lower than the total biomass that we're getting in the downstream of the areas. In other words, what we're getting is the cumulative effect of spawning up here, spawning down here, and as you go from the upper reaches to the lower reaches, you're getting more and more fish, which is what you'd expect. It, that's not rocket science, but it, it seemed to work. In other words, we could then, taking the difference between there and there, figure out how much spawning occurred in this area. So between Dees Island and New Westminster in 1995, we figured about 50% of the spawning occurred there. Above there, another 50% and a little bit above Arnston Island. And the total biomass that we got in 1995, which is when people were really worried about hooligans, was 250 tons. In 1996, just after everyone was coming, there was a bonanza. It was a huge year. We estimated over 1,580 tons, and, and most of these fish were spawning between Dees Island and Westminster. 1997, down to 56 tons. And, and again, most of them were above New Westminster. 
1998, this was again the distribution. No spawning at all below Westminster and, and some above Barnes Island. 1999, the same sort of thing. In other words, when you go through time by time, you can figure out roughly what the total biomass is and roughly where they spawn. <coughs> 390 tons would be pretty, pretty good. And just to flash through, so on. This is again the, the same sort of thing depicting where, where hooligans are found in the Fraser. We haven't done very much in the North Arm. Logistically, it was difficult to sample here and over here. This just shows where they are, depth distribution, the, the surface toe, a five meter toe, and a 10 meter toe. One thing that is interesting, I think this will show as a, as a, <coughs> a video. This is just flashing through time by time don't do this for too long, but this is now showing 2001, 2002. And this is the uh, position of the river. That's the, the, oops. That would be the north side. This is the middle side. That's the south side. And, and where they're spawning, when you sum it up by depth, there seems to be a tendency to, to favor the north side of the river, which is kind of interesting. And, and I think it's because, I, I'm speculating, it's because there are a lot of tributaries that come in from Pitt Lake, um, Stave Lake, Harrison Lake, that might make the north side slightly cooler. But that's just speculation. But it could be really quite relevant to what people are doing vis-a-vis -vis some of the proposed developments. Fraser. These are the biomass trends in the Fraser. This is a, 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 a figure that is um, it, it's from the 2012 so-called recovery potential. <laughs> It's taking some of Megan Moody's uh, estimates of what the, the past abundance was in the Fraser. Um, this is a, just an index. It's, it's, not, it's not done by time. This is the catch in terms of tons. The black indicates the catch records. And at one time, they're getting 250 tons a year. Not, not a lot relative to what the herring population would be, or the herring catches, or even salmon catches, but, but, but quite a bit in terms of what you see now. And the catch has gradually diminished. This is the, 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 the estimate in that, uh, in that report, what was happening to the biomass at that time, going down and down. This is the most recent estimate of, of biomass in the Fraser, starting in 1994, going on to 2014. It, there's some confidence limits around that, but these are what the numbers look like, going from 19, 1995, I should say, to 2014. Um, the total estimate was 66 tons. You could put some air bars in there, but, but it's not something that inspires confidence. And certainly using exactly the same techniques um, 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, the total estimates of biomass were quite a bit higher. These estimates are conservative because we're not accounting for mortality between the eggs and the larval stage. And they might be especially conservative because there could be some spawning below Keys Island, which is the southernmost area that we were looking at. Um, this is coming back now to say that but there's a lot more hooligans in the ocean than in the rivers. And this is, again, from the same report in 2000. Um, I think Murdoch had quite a bit to do with this particular one, and this is kind of crappy figure to look at, but um, and I didn't mean he. I didn't mean that he was responsible for that. Uh, this 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 line up here shows the sort of an estimate of the offshore biomass. This this thing here shows the sort of the uh, a, a trend of the the freshwater biomass, and it's a log scale. It's two orders of magnitude. Yeah. Um, this is oops. I'm gonna, this is a terrible thing to say, to put on. I just put it on because this is a a very recent report coming out of the U.S. Um, do I have one without that? Uh, the Americans are not quite so bashful about produ uh, producing estimates of uh, bio uh, population abundance in near shore waters, but DFO, five minutes, is. Anyway, uh, they say, you know, they came up with about 88 million little fish in 2009, 48 million in 2012. That if you allow for estimates of 30, 20, 30 uh, 
grams per fish, that comes out to, um, you know, probably around uh, 10,000 metric tons. A lot more than we're seeing. Oops, I said 5,000. Call me a liar for 5,000 tons. It's a rough estimate, but there's a lot of fish other than this offshore. And this is what the Americans, this is the new thing. They're, they're off the coast of Washington, they're finding lots of hooligans too. I'm going to just jump ahead. One of the, the difficulties we had when the, with, with the uh, recovery thing was trying to figure out what's the relationship between fish in the offshore and, and trends in the river. People concluded they, could, they couldn't do anything with it. But, you know, when you just look, look for the, the, the simple-minded uh, catches in this thing, off the coast of Washington, they're finding lots of hooligans. So I'm going to just jump ahead. One of the, the difficulties we had when the, with, with the uh, recovery thing was trying to figure out what's the relationship between fish in the offshore and, and trends in the river. People concluded they, that they couldn't do anything with it. But, you know, when you just look, look for the, the, the simple-minded uh, catches in the, the shrimp trawl research surveys, where this is the catches in the Columbia, it does seem, seem to be quite a bit of coherence. Both crashed exactly at the same time. So now I just want to briefly end with a couple of things going on. I think that the gaps are really quite important. And, and there's some work that I think we could do in the Fraser that would do it. And, and we started this work funded by the... Uh, Port Metro Vancouver and, and the um, Salmon Foundation to test the feasibility of tagging with sonic tags. It, it can be done. The, the, uh, it's been done in Alaska, and that's what we're trying to do. But before you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars buying tags, it's the idea, can you catch them live? And that's what we aim to do. I'm going to just go ahead and get that for a second and see if I can. did get really quite well healed. So in that case, what we did was um, just come along with a little scalpel and just sacrificed a few meshes, and, and the fish came out really quite nicely. And we brought 300 live fish back here, you can see this way. And um, so part of the message is, there's no good reason why we can all the floor of this one couldn't be done. Uh, you, can, you can do tagging work, do lots of physiological work. Be really quite useful, um, in my opinion. And then just to show one of the live bullets in the little bucket that uh, they were they were rigorous, vigorous, healthy fish. The only problem we had is that I tended to kill them by leaving them in the buckets too long in transit here. But, but you know, it, it is a it is. Oh, that shut the stone thing off. I'm almost dead anyway, but uh, I have one concluding slide. Um, but, the, but the long and short of it is, <coughs> don't bother putting it on. Um, oh, I was going to 
to show you what we found. I'm not going to belabor it because we didn't find very much. We, uh, this is where we fished in the Fraser, out, out in, the, in, the, in the estuarine waters, up to there. Um, I, I only put these on just to show that there were no differences in, in salinity or, or differences in salinity, but, but no difference in temperature. We caught most of the fish up in the river. We caught no fish out in the estuary. In other words, uh, uh, before we started this work, I was really worried about impacts in the estuarine waters. Now I'm really more and more worried about impacts in the river, because these fish seem to come from the ocean. They sit in the salt water wedge deep in the river. And this, if you impact the river, you're going to impact them. So that's the, the, the very simple thing we learned. And I'm not expressing it very well, but, but this is where we refer, this is our catch rate. We had a, a simple-minded CPUE. We were finding the fish mainly uh, above these island up, up in this area. A little bit in, in, in this area where there's slightly slower, slightly saline water. This is our lowest sampling area for assessments, but there could be some spawning right there. So that's part of the message. The message is um, we, could be, we could be underestimating hooligans, although not by two orders of magnitude. The other message is that um, these fish are amenable to study, and uh, they, they study for, as live fish. You can bring them into the lab. Sang had them had, uh, video recorders on them. Um, he was doing various types of physiological tests. Raising, trying to raise eggs and larvae, you can do lots with these things. And um, that's the end of it. Thank you. <laughs> It didn't crash in the Bellacoola uh, until about 1997 or 8. It did crash in the Columbia, uh, sorry, in, in the Fraser and the Columbia. In First Nations in the Columbia, it, it doesn't seem to be as prominent as that. But for some reason, um, south of the Plina Plina, they, they don't make grease. Grease is, is a fun, as a, occurs north of the Fraser. When you make grease, you set up these camps, that's when then they, they really are on. Density dependence of? And like, say, for instance, like years where there's lots of eggs, there might be survival of white moths and stuff like that. I, I think the answer is we don't know very much at all. Um, it's not clear to me. It's not clear to me. This is maybe not answering your question. But in that 2012 report, the, 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 the assumption is that these very low so-called escapements you're getting in fresh water are sufficient to generate the numbers of fish we're seeing offshore. And I don't think they are. I don't think that you can get 10 or 20 tons of hooligans in the Fraser that are generating anything, anything like we're seeing offshore. So, so that, that's part of the, the, the um, discrepancy unsolved as far as I'm concerned. Just a follow-up question. Does that make you think that they might be seeing offshore as well? Or is it different populations? Of course, the shrimp fishermen said they are. Um, because they're trying to get us off their back, and, and that became a very heated issue. It still is a heated issue, because they take more fish as bycatch than we're seeing sometimes in the Fraser. But, but you know, to their credit, they're seeing lots of fish out there. There's no question that there's lots of hooligans. Um, and and um, tell me your question again. <laughs> oh, I was just wondering if you thought that they had more than one reproductive strategy, or that they were... Uh, and, 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 and I don't...
don't know if, if they can spawn in, in, in marine waters, but it seems to me to have survived for millions of years. They must have that. It's just we haven't seen it. and early 70s, the biomass of the shrimp started to decrease in the Gulf. We went back to the bean trawls simply to avoid the bycatch. And the bean trawls have very little impact on the oligon. But the autocol is the one that has a bycatch, has a high uh, bycatch problem. And the reason for that is the speed of uh, having to tow the net to keep the boards open which is about 2.6 to 3 knots, whereas the beam trawl is, uh, is told at 1.1 knots. Yeah, I, I agree entirely. Um, I think that the, 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 the bycatch issue it, it can be solved. The Americans are doing quite a bit. Bob Hanna is doing a, a lot. But, but, but you, among others, have, have shown that, that hooligans hang out in, in areas where shrimp are, but above the shrimp. And, and so when you have these little, these little beam trawl nets, there's several, several kind of nets. Some are called low rise, and some are called high rise, which means that the distance between the lead line and the cork line, if it's very high, it'll start to catch hooligans. If it's very small, they don't. Called the foot rope. Yeah. Uh, there's a new uh, development uh, that's uh, coming to play in uh, uh, Oregon and Washington on using uh, uh, green, blue colored lights on the head ropes. And uh, it's uh, chasing the oligon away, and it's reducing the bycatch. And they're doing research on that. We're well, investing uh, in, uh, through the uh, shrimp council. We're investing uh, uh, some money in to get done on the some of the uh, Canadian nets to see how it works. It was quite surprising at first when I when I read about it, because usually fish are attracted by light. And uh, I thought that would be the problem because that's one way we used to pick lamp for the carrying and uh, so on, and we used to have a heavy trap by catch. But when uh, the type of light that they're using uh, came out, it could be because it looks so much like the, uh, uh, the, j the goose jellyfish and uh, these other ones, which would then some of the larger jellyfish would be predators, and they, that could be driving them away. I don't know. They're just doing research on that now, and we're just beginning, beginning to get into it here. Well, I, I believe that we could develop some, some technology to use gill nets to catch live hooligans in offshore waters. I think you could take the larger vessels, get them out there, and if we could tag fish on the shell, it, it could, you, could, you could do exactly the kind of test that you're talking about. And, uh, it would take somebody like you who can configure the gear. And we're thinking about that as a, as a proposal, but um, but it would be a, it would be a, a novel thing to do. Yeah, our shrimp caucus is meeting on December the third. Uh -huh. we'll, we'll be discussing that. Then. Do you guys want to follow up because Tony was asking something first, I think. Uh, yeah, then Tony first, and then you, and then. My uh, rodent ancestors have encouraged me to nibble away at this. I'm animal. sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. I can share those with you, I'm sure. Um, yeah, uh, the anomaly. Um, has anybody looked at the gonads of the offshore population? I mean, I'm going to ask the question really as to whether these offshore fish spawn every year. There are a lot of species of Teleos that don't spawn every year. So that would, would be one hypothesis for explaining the anomaly. The answer to your question is yes, we've looked at them in, in the lab. I've looked at more than I've ever cared to. Um, uh, and, and they are just, just, like, uh, just like herring. You know, you, when you catch them, as they're approaching their spawning season, virtually all are underdeveloped in one way or the other. But the smaller ones, sometimes you can't tell. So if they're, they're skipping ones, it would, it would be as
minister would have considered it and looked about the various things. And uh, the minister then would have had to have made a decision about whether to list it as endangered or threatened. And uh, so, uh, so part of the question is, had, had the minister decided to list it or not list it on that threatened or endangered? And then uh, he, he hadn't, but uh, let's say he did. Uh, could, could you actually uh, tell us uh, what might happen in terms of habitat management or fisheries management if, if those are listed? Uh, no, I, 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 I'm sorry, I can't. I, I get, I just get bored with the, um, all, all the bureaucracy that comes with that. What I can tell you is that uh, we wanted to, um, we wanted to catch 300 hooligans. Uh, uh, that's what we said for this this thing, and that DFO, DFO very reluctantly. In fact, we had to go above heads to, to get the 300. They wouldn't, they wouldn't allow us to catch any more than 300. So we wanted to take another 20. But they do allow, DFO does allow an excess of a ton or two by catch offshore. But there's a real discrepancy between that. So, so the, one, of the, one of the difficulties of doing more of this work is just getting permission to do it. So the point is, and relevant to your question, is people are very skittish about allowing any catches. I don't see that there's an equivalent concern about impacts on the habitat. And, and so I, that's another another discrepancy I can't, can't address. I didn't mean I was bored with it. I just I just get frustrated with it. Yeah. But could, do you know enough to say uh, what should be protected in terms of habitat? Like what <clears throat> what in the river would be a central habitat for pollutants? Can they just uh, continue exactly as they have been with dredging and uh, all the development uh, these edges or The only thing that we, we do know is that um, we shouldn't dredge during spawning season. Uh, we did manage to stop that. that and even that was a challenge. Um, but the answer to your question is no. I was really worried about the, uh, the estuarine waters, particularly the, the coal port. And not. If, I had to, uh, if I had to put my concern there anywhere, I would be a, away from the estuary and into, um, in, into more of the, the lower river where they, I think they hold. And where intense predation during that the, in the saltwater wedge between basically Stevenson up to New Westminster, I think that's very important. Carl, last question. That uh, offshore distribution was an awful lot like the offshore distribution that you looked at from the Columbia. What, what about the possibility that the main stop, you just a big Columbia stop, and that those things you see off the island and are mainly uh, dispersing northward? I think that's a credible hypothesis. The um, the uh, microsatellite DNA does say that they they are reproductively separated. However, that was based on samples that were we mm -hmm. collected 15 years ago now, and I don't know that anyone has done the, the next step in putting it all together and maybe looking at more more alleles or, or no microsatellite data from the offshore. Oh sure, when you and, and but but the point is they don't hit the baseline studies. So uh, so it, when we did the fr from the Columbia, we had we had one from the main stem of the Columbia, one from the Cowlitz, and they were slightly different even within the Columbia, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, so some more genetic analysis would certainly.